Hello, and welcome to another episode of Sound Strategic. I'm May Nowens. In today's episode, we'll be discussing international arms control and how new technologies are complicating efforts to safeguard existing arms control frameworks globally. Concerns over the future of arms control have been growing steadily in recent years. Many of the key arms control agreements in place today date back to the end of the Cold War. But as geopolitical realities and tensions have changed since the collapse of the Soviet Union, many policymakers argue there's an urgent need to reinvigorate controls over the development of nuclear and non-nuclear missile capabilities. The U.S. withdrawal from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, INF Treaty, in August 2019, amid long-standing allegations of Russian breaches of the treaty, only highlight concerns that the international arms control architecture is weakening. With the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or New START, due to expire in February 2021, unless the treaty is extended, it is likely the debate around the future of arms control will continue, which is why we felt this was such an important topic to address in this episode. To provide further insight into this topic, I'm joined by Douglas Berry, Timothy Wright, and Pavel Podvig, who are all part of the IISS's Missile Dialogue Initiative a project that aims to strengthen the international discussion around emerging missile capabilities and their implications for for global security. Douglas is a senior fellow for military airspace, and beyond his role as a senior member of the MDI research team, he provides regular analysis on all the latest developments in military airspace capabilities for the annual Military Balance publication. He's also contributed to a recent IISS strategic dossier on Russia's military modernization efforts and their security implications. Tim, as program manager of the Defense and Military Analysis Program, manages the implementation of the Missile Dialogue Initiative, supporting the development of the program's research agenda and various policy workshops. He also writes on European and South Asian missile developments. We're especially pleased that Pavel is able to join us today. He's a member of the MDI's advisory board that oversees the project, as well as a senior researcher in the WMD program at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, or UNIDIR. His current research focuses on nuclear disarmament, arms control, and nuclear security. He is also the director of the Russian Strategic Nuclear Forces Project, which provides Russian citizens and policymakers with information about nuclear weapons, arms control, and disarmament based on open scientific analysis. Thank you all for joining me on the show today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Hi, Mia. Thanks very much, Mia. So to start, Doug, perhaps, could you tell us about the MDI program at the IISS and what issues within arms control is hoping to address specifically? Uh, Mia, perhaps I'll start uh, uh, and Tim can uh, finish and fill in the bits I, uh, I miss out or overlook. In general terms, obviously, there's considerable concern uh, within the kind of community, uh, and by that I mean academics, think tankers, and indeed governments, as to the kind of state of arms control, uh, strategic arms control in particular. And MDI was kind of set up with the support of the German uh, Foreign Ministry to to basically provide a clearinghouse where people could discuss the, the issues in a way which might begin to, to, to provide some kind of path forward. Um, so you've got an, an expert community uh, drawn from uh, those groups, considering some of the key questions around emerging technologies uh, and perhaps some of the issues where uh, the main players, the peer rivals, as it were, perhaps some t- sometimes talk past one another rather than talk to one another. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think Doug has covered most of the bases. I mean, just like to add that you know, the project doesn't start with a with a preconceived notion of what specific policies or solutions to pursue. You know, MDI and the IISS and the uh, the German Federal Foreign Office. We're we're not going to propose policies. We want to you know, act as a convening platform. Um, have these difficult discussion, discussions between governments who sometimes aren't talking about these issues. And as Doug says, you know, engage the expert community. Um, and an international expert community as well. And I think that can be seen both through MDI's advisory board, members of the expert network, and also people who have participated and attended the events. You know, this isn't a, um, you know, the, the issues which are, are they're global, they're international issues. And, you know, we want to consider what the Russian perspective is, what the Chinese perspective is, how, the, how these issues look from Japan or South Korea, you know, of course, as well as Europe. So I think, um, you know, that that's one of the really important things about MDI is that it's, there to engage in genuine dialogue 
um, underpinned by you know the principles of objectivity, and driven by you know this you know dispassionate analysis of, of data and, and facts. Let's dive into one of those issues that uh, MDI has covered. As we mentioned earlier, concerns around the sustainability of arms control have been growing for some time. Did the U.S. withdrawal from the INF Treaty last year come as a surprise to any of you? And what does its breakdown tell us about the current politics around arms control, if any? It, did it come as a surprise? Uh, no, this has been a, a, a long-standing problem uh, with the U.S. and latterly its NATO allies um, concerned that the uh, Russians were in substantive material breach of the, the INF Treaty, in particular the the the, the, the system at the heart of the concern is a is a ground launched cruise missile with a range which the US and its allies uh, say is significantly greater than the 500 kilometer uh, lower threshold for for the INF. In fact, if if kind of the the US and allied view is it, is taken on board, this is a 2,000 kilometer range plus weapon which has been developed and deployed. Uh, the Russians uh, flatly deny this, uh, and to this day it's continued to deny it. But there seems to be you know, at least a considerable circumstantial material to, to, to support the, the US and allied position. Uh, and, and it's a significant breach, uh, uh, and the US and its allies have tried for, for years to get the, the Russians back into compliance and unfortunately failed. Um, hence why the, the US decided to withdraw, which was a great pity because the INF was a, a very significant treaty indeed. Well, I think it's a bit more complicated, uh, at least uh, the way uh, I see it, uh, in in that uh, it, the withdrawal uh, from the INF treaty uh, was, uh, I mean, it wasn't a surprise in the sense that it was everything went uh, in that direction. Uh, but uh, you could argue that it was not necessarily the uh, right decision in the uh, circumstances. Uh, I think uh, the the severity of the breach uh, could be disputed, in fact, in, uh, in that uh, it's militarily significance. Uh, uh, even if we assume that uh, the missile that Russia has developed and deployed uh, is indeed uh, in breach of the treaty. Uh, I think uh, the the real kind of horse and carriage uh, there is not uh, necessarily land based um, uh, land based cruise missiles. Uh, if you look at the INF treaty, uh, it has uh, a very large hole you know, the size of the um, sea launch cruise missile arsenal. And uh, if you look at the numbers, you could see that, uh, for example, Russia is uh, ac ac very actively uh, deploying uh, sea launch cruise missiles on all kinds of ships and uh, submarines. Uh, from that point of view, uh, the even a hundred uh, or s missiles uh, on land uh, would not necessarily add uh, very significant military capability. Uh, again, there there is a political dimension of this, of course, and uh, I would agree that uh, from the political point of view, uh, the United States uh, felt compelled to do something about that uh, breach. Uh, but uh, again, uh, I think uh, it would have been better for everyone uh, if uh, the treaty was preserved as it as as it was. Uh, and used as an instrument to resolve the dispute, uh, because at the kind of the eleventh hour, uh, Russia actually tried to uh, be open about its uh, its missile, and there was an attempt to do something uh, about that. About that, uh, but and again, we don't know where this uh, discussion would have would have would have gone. But uh, I think there was a chance to actually uh, uh, manage this process in a, in a certain way, although that would have been difficult, of course. Yeah, um, j just to add on that, I mean, if, if you know, with, with what Pavel was saying about it's not adding a significant capability, I think in 2018, the Russians might have only had two battalions with four launchers per battalion or so. So, you know, it's not 
the, and the numbers aren't huge, but then, you know, you break the spirit of the treaty, don't you? I mean, you could say with New Start, well, you know, they have, there are certain restrictions on the number of, you know, deployed nuclear warheads. Well, what if you go over that by 10, 15 or so, you know, does that really matter in sort of the grand numbers? I mean, I, I, I I'm, I'm not sure. I, you, if you're, if you're, you're breaking it only by a slight amount, you're still breaking it though, aren't you? Uh, well, I, I think it's, again, to put it bluntly, uh, we haven't seen the evidence and uh, I don't uh, have a particular reason to uh, dispute uh, the uh, statements made by the United States that that was indeed a violation. But if you look at uh, it carefully, uh, the violation was not direct, uh, and uh, there was a room for misunderstanding. And as I say, uh, uh, what the United States accused Russia of obfuscating the, uh, or hiding the true nature of the program and everything, but you, if you look at it from uh, another point of view, uh, what one side sees as obfuscating, the other side uh, considers just the following strictly following the letter of the treaty. So it's, uh, again, I'm not saying that Russia is necessarily, uh, necessarily has a point, but what, what I'm saying is that uh, the, the way uh, this whole dispute developed uh, actually uh, undermined uh, the, the trust in the mechanisms of arms control. Uh, because we had uh, there, there was a commission, uh, the bilateral commission that was supposed to uh, look into this kind of issues, and I am still convinced that if that issue uh, went first to the level of technical experts uh, through the uh, bilateral commission, uh, I think uh, uh, some solution uh, would have been found. So I, I think it's uh, it just both sides mishandled it, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, if I can just. Um follow up on on pavel's comments and i admire pavel's optimism that a, a resolution for this could have been found uh, i i'm slightly more pessimistic at this point although i wish that the inf could have been sustained um partly because the the, the us had been trying pretty much for the better part of a decade um to uh, as they saw it get the russians to face up to the to, to the treaty breach uh and obviously um the russians just flatly denied uh, any breach at all, uh, despite um, the, the US position. Uh, and initially, it was the US, and it then began to take its allies with it. You saw um, NATO nations come out and support the, the US position. Now, obviously, none of us have seen the the kind of classified material that the, the US has, and I would imagine has shared at least some with it with its allies, and, and its allies have probably got their own material. But this, you know, there was a consensus that this was not kind of a marginal uh, breach of the treaty, but that it was it was significant. Um, I, 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 and you know, whether it is only a, a hundred or so glycums, um, you know, these are almost certainly dual capable weapons. If if you take the U.S. claims at face value, um, uh, with a two and a half thousand kilometer range, which in a European context it is militarily significant. So on all, all in all, I think that the, the situation was problematic, and that at some point you have to say, uh, if we can't persuade you to come back into compliance, then we have to leave the treaty, because otherwise the treaty effectively becomes meaningless if one side does what it likes. Uh, uh, pretends that it isn't doing it, uh, uh, and the other side just kind of sits in its hands. So, I mean, I, 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 could it have been sustained? Uh, I wish it could have been, but uh, unlike Pavel, I kind of think that you know that the, the U.S. had run out of run out a road on it, uh, and furthermore, especially with the current administration, although it didn't. You know, I, I, you know, some people suggest that the, the treaty collapsed because the U.S. basically wanted out to to, to put these classes of weapons in the Indo-Pacific. I don't think that's, that, that's certainly not my view of what happened, but it does actually provide further impetus for the US uh, to, to move. It felt that it was kind of, rightly or wrongly, it was a disadvantage in the Indo-Pacific because of the INF Treaty. It didn't leave the INF Treaty because of this, but uh, that kind of perception certainly didn't 
didn't provide the US with any impetus to try and persuade Moscow uh, one more time to, to, to actually um, come clean, as it were, on, on what it saw as a breach. Uh, and to this day, Moscow continues to deny that the, the, the glickum in question, the 9M729, is, is a material breach or was a material breach of what was the INF Treaty. Maybe just quickly, you've touched upon the political uh, dimensions and considerations for the fall of the INF Treaty. But considering you start an open skies treaty, Doug, I think you were the one that mentioned very briefly that there were technical considerations that are bringing these two uh, treaties into a similar strain. Can you explain per- to our listeners perhaps which each of these agreements are and why they're under a new fresh scrutiny if you do say that they're more technical in nature? Sure, may I, I, I'll start and I'm sure Pavel and Tim can, can add, uh, they can fill in what I when I skip over detail, that perhaps is important. Uh, New START, obviously, as the name implies, Strategic Arms uh, Control Treaty um, sets ceilings on on, on warhead numbers uh, and delivery platforms, so ICBMs, uh, bombers, etc. Open Skies, a uh, different kind of uh, treaty in that it basically provides, I think, 34 countries with uh, short notice overflight rights, um, really as, to, uh, as confidence building measures to see um, what some other countries are, are, are doing in terms of exercises, perhaps, or, or, or sites of interest and to get, you know, to, to basically have a kind of verifiable um, view uh, of what is happening. Um, interestingly, perhaps less important for the US uh, in the sense that it obviously has national technical means. And by that, you know, I'm pretty much talking about uh, reconnaissance satellites to see what's going on. But for a lot of the other signatory nations, they don't have that capability. So so Open Skies is, is, is particularly important for them. Uh, hence the, the, the great pity that at the moment the US has decided it wants to leave. Um, and for reasons that really aren't uh, um, I, I, as hard and fast as it were as the uh, as the INF, I think the INF treaty was you know the the, the nature of the allegations and the claims were, were such that it would be very difficult to to, to save it. Open skies, um, you know, there are multiple claims and, uh, and allegations of, of you know the countries not strictly abiding by the by the agreement, they're much more marginal, they're much more about interpretation in, in my view. And as such, um, you know, the, 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 you could see a situation where, where the, the its allies could persuade the US to, to remain in open skies. If I could build on that, um, you know, Doug, Doug's right. And some, some of the issues which have been raised with open skies, I mean, open, so one of them is looking at um, in, in, in Georgia with the two breakaway regions, South Obsetia and Abkhazia, the Open Skies Treaty has provision which states that parties cannot fly within a 10 kilometer, ten kilometers of the border of a non-signatory. Now, Russia recognizes South Ossetia and Abkhazia as being sovereign nations and then therefore has an issue with any overflights going near those areas. I mean, and then Georgia then retaliates and then says, no, we're going to close open, we're going to close Russian overflights to Georgia. And then, you know, the US gets involved. And then this is part of the reason that Mike Pompeo mentioned in, in May this year for, uh, for the US wanting to pull out. I mean, you know, open skies isn't meant, isn't a border resolution treaty. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's running into problems because of Russia's, you know, breakdown in relations with its, with its neighbors. Um, you know, you would, you would like to think that, you know, that it's something that could be fixed. Um, you know, the Kaliningrad oblast as well. I mean, there's there's an issue which some of the listeners might be familiar with, um, which is another thing which Mike Pompeo raised as being a, a problem with the treaty. Um, and since 2014, Russia has imposed a, a, a maximum restriction of 500 kilometers crossing over the Kaliningrad oblast. I think this goes back to a an over a Polish overflight that year, which crisscrossed and went back and forth, and it co- it caused a lot of um, it caused a lot of sort of uh, um, air tra- traffic issues. The restriction doesn't amount to a complete ban over the region, but it does reduce the amount of data that can be collected. Um, but again, you know, this is something that is re- is resolvable, and you know, the the US has then restricted overflights over Alaska. Um, and you know these are you know most of these things are tit for tat, and you would like to think that they can be solved. And the U.S. has given Russia some space. You know, uh, it said you know we we're not necessarily going to leave if if the issues can be resolved, we'll stay. Um, but that's in about one month and a week now until until that's uh, until that gets until the U.S. might withdraw. So you know, 
I've not I've not really heard any significant progress that's been made on it. And so, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't look very good at the moment, does it? I think. I, I think the story with the Open Skies Treaty uh, just uh, again uh, shows that uh, the the issues, in fact, can be resolved uh, if there is a will to resolve them. Uh, for example, this. A uh, limit that uh, Tim mentioned of the 10 kilometers uh, of uh, Abkhazia in South Ossetia, uh, that Russia at some point agreed uh, to to leave that uh, and let uh, Open Skies planes to fly there. Uh, Russia has its own list of concerns uh, about Alaska and others. Uh, so there, there, there are there are issues, and there there are issues in 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 most treaties. It's never very smooth, uh, but uh, it, it's uh, in my view there are ways of dealing with issues. And uh, in my view, uh, a you 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 have to be transparent about what your concerns are, uh, and you have to be uh, willing to. Uh, at least listen to the uh, to the uh, other side and to see what these concerns are. For example, the uh, that that uh, fly that crisscrossed Kaliningrad. Uh, I think it just used up all the quota yearly quota just crossing Kaliningrad. I think you could, yeah, it may not be strictly in the letter of the treaty that this kind of thing uh, is uh, prohibited, uh, but again, you could at least. Uh, listen to the argument that this is a major disruption to tra traffic, uh, air traffic, and find a way to deal with that. So that's, uh, it, it's really uh, the balance between, uh, again, uh, the uh, uh, the technical issues uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, kind of a political will to find a solution and preserve the treaty. And this is exactly what we, we, we this is why the INF treaty collapsed because there was no, uh, no transparency and there was no uh, willingness to, uh, to listen to, uh, to others and try at least to find a way out of a difficult situation. Yeah, I mean, just to follow up on Pavel's comments, I think that the issues with open skies uh, and the issue with the INF, um, might appear at least superficially similar, but I think that whereas the open skies ones are, you know, they, they are, you know, com you, know you can see a path to resolution. Well, the INF uh, issue, uh, uh, unless uh, Russia had said, okay, actually we have developed this weapon, we have fielded it, uh, 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 and uh, that was a mistake, uh, and we're going to return to compliance, um, then you know, after numerous years of the U.S. kind of saying you need to do this, uh, it, it seemed to me that you 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 have reached the end of that road, uh, and that barring a, a Russian admission, um, the, the the U.S. was going to withdraw. Open skies, as I say, I think the the issues are are, are much um, much more resolvable if you were if there's a little bit of goodwill amongst all of the parties. I think that's a really good point to make and an excellent uh, way to segue into my next question for you all, which is on the topic of taking each other's concerns into consideration. On the issue of a new start agreement, the lead Russian negotiator, Sergei Ryabkov, has said that current U.S. requests to renew the agreement only if it also includes China's nuclear missile arsenal is a quote-unquote non-starter. U.S. concerns around China's growing military capabilities are, of course, well documented. But do you think that this is the best way for the U.S. to achieve its objective of limiting Chinese nuclear capabilities? Yeah, certainly not. Uh, uh, this is far from the best way uh, of dealing with uh, Chinese military capabilities, uh, because even if Russia would want to engage China in these discussions, uh, there, there is no way for Russia to do that, uh, and that's I, I think this is uh, this is where I I see uh, the point of uh, Russian diplomats. Uh, it is of course difficult to get China into this discussion, and uh, uh, but there are kind of a pressure or peer pressure uh, is probably not the best way of of doing so. Uh, for example, I believe that if there is a, 
uh, if there is a concern about the potential growth of uh, China's nuclear arsenal, uh, there are ways of doing uh, dealing with that. Uh, for example, starting to work on fissile material cutoff treaty because we know that China doesn't have enough uh, material to uh, seriously increase uh, its uh, nuclear forces. Uh, so, uh, but instead, uh, it's uh, the United States is trying to. Uh, suggests certain arrangement that it's not clear uh, what what would China get out of that, even if it would agree. So that's I don't think that that's been very productive. Yeah, and I obviously completely agree with Pavel on this. That um, you know, as a kind of tactic for sustaining the treaty, um, you know, Washington saying unless uh, Moscow, you can bring uh, Beijing to the party, as it were. Uh, we're we're going to walk away from it. Seems to me just you know kind of counterintuitive. It, do, it doesn't really make sense. If you know if you want to sustain the treaty, um, then you recognise that you kind of you just say to the Russians, okay, well let's let's move ahead as is. By the way, we'd like at some point to you know to involve China in in in, in all of this, but you know kind of using the kind of um, Chinese involvement uh, uh, as a kind of uh, mechanism to either you know sustain it or, 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 or to walk away from it. Uh, it seems to me incoherent. Perhaps it, it was a tactic uh, on the part of the, the Trump administration. Um, who can tell? But uh, as a negotiating tactic, it, it, it looks to me uh, less than ideal. Uh, that you're going to risk the whole treaty simply to get the Chinese to come to the table. Uh, and the Chinese understandably turn around and say, well, look at the size of your two arsenals uh, and look at the size of ours. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about um, those arsenals when, when yours are more akin to ours in terms of size. So it, you can you can see where Beijing's argument comes from. And to be perfectly honest, you can have some kind of sympathy with that argument when you look at the respective arsenal sizes. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it seems very strange if the US is so worried about strategic stability that it would throw away the New START treaty because of concerns over China's nuclear arsenal when it would then lose the ability to you know, conduct inspection, verification of Russia's nuclear arsenal, which is, you know, which is much larger. I think the figures are, you know, two, to around two, three hundred Chinese systems. And for Russia, with deployed systems under New Start, it's 15, 1,500 or so. I mean, it it it, it just seems mad. It's, it's you know throwing the the baby out with the bathwater. I think it's you know it's not it's not a particularly good idea, and I, I don't think there's really many. I, I don't think anyone would suggest that getting China involved in arms control at some point is 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 a is a bad idea. I think there is you know there is um, some some concern, and rightly so, that China perhaps might need to. At some point, join some form of arms control treaty, but I think you know this approach is is, is not good, and I, I don't really think there are many people who would support it. Yeah, just a very uh, very brief point uh, that this whole discussion uh, we we assume uh, generously so I think that uh, the 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 goal of the uh, the administration is to bring China into arms control, and I'm not sure that that's actually uh, the case uh, because. Precisely because we see that attempt to bring China in, uh, it it is and it looks like and it probably is uh, just uh, uh, the uh, something uh, that provides cover for not extending the uh, New Start Treaty, uh, and it sort of it is a politically uh, you could you could say that uh, it is a politically uh, better looking way than just kind of saying, uh, saying that uh, we are not going to extend. Instead, the administration is saying, no, we would love to, but only if China uh, also joins. And that almost uh, presents the administration as a champion of arms control, and uh, while in fact it is uh, exactly the opposite. I, th I think, well, as, as Pavel says, I think, I think it's, it's a good point, but I, I do wonder, I mean, you Trump wants to be this ultimate deal maker, doesn't he? And I, I think you you can see the level of attention he has given this. I think over the last six months, he's spoken at least six times on the phone with Putin about New Start. Now, I, I don't think these are probably the most um, you know detailed of conversations, but I think the amount of effort you can see him trying to put into it at least shows that he is somewhat serious about it. I think 
if he really was just trying to use China as the as the the poison pill to kill the treaty, perhaps there wouldn't be the the, the level of interest that the Americans are trying to put on this. So I think you know their attitude has changed a little bit now. They have said, you know, we realise now that China we're not going to get them involved in China. But then they do have other concerns as well. And I think, you know, we're, we're probably going to discuss these in a little bit, but perhaps some of Russia's new strategic systems as well, um, you know, whether they are going to be, you know, included in new start. I mean, we know that the avant-garde hypersonic um, glide vehicle will be, and the new um, Sarmat ICBM will be too. But then other things like Poseidon, you know, fall outside of it, the beat and the uh, the bilateral consultative commission. Is that is that correct for New Start? I mean, that I think might be able to bring that in. But then there are other things like Burevestnik and other sort of new Russian missile systems which are being made, which are seriously concerning. And and you know, I think the thing is though is as, as we've sort of all you know talked about is that it's better to try to work these things out while you're in a treaty rather than just tear the treaty up and then try to fix it afterwards i mean what's you know it's the expression about being in the tent i won't i won't use it here but you know i think that's that's the right one to think of in this case so am i understanding then that you all are relatively negative about or at least pessimistic about the renewal of a new start given the current political climate or am i misunderstanding that Are we optimistic or pessimistic? Just remind me never to go on a camping holiday with Tim. (sighs) Kind of somewhere in between optimistic and pessimistic, if that isn't a horrible fence-setting position. Um, I hope that new start is extended, um, be it between 12 and, you know, and 60 months. So, you know, somewhere between a year and a five-year extension. Um, That would be the best outcome. Um, Obviously, uh, (laughs) The, the 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 U.S. walking away from the treaty would be would be a poor outcome, uh, if not uh, if not worse. Um, and you kind of hope that there are currently conversations going on between the U.S. and its allies about this, or the allies are making their their positions or their feelings known about the that the, the they want to keep um, the, the the treaty going. I think it depends as well on the November election. I mean, the you know the the Biden camp have said that they would like to extend New Start. Um, I think that if they you know they're going to have very very little time, but I think I mean Pavel will probably be, be able to explain this better. But I think it only require it doesn't require legislative um, you know sort of a it doesn't require either the Senate or the uh, the Duma to to extend it. I think it can be done by executive order. So it, it may it may just be that it's going to happen really last minute. But you know, if 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 Joe Biden wins in November, potentially you might you might get an extension in twenty twenty one. Um, you know, I, I think I think it does depend a lot on the administration because I think the Republicans and Democrats do think very differently about the treaty. Um, and you know, if, if things change in November, then it, it might be you know it might get might get extended. It might be that it's extended, and then during that extension period, they're trying to work out some of the issues with the treaty. Um, as Pavel said, you know, no treaty is perfect. Every every treaty has issues, um, and you know, it can be extended up to five years. So it might be that they might have, as Doug says, a perhaps a shorter one. Um, and then have some reforms treaty, or, or perhaps it might just go for the full five years. But I think it really does depend on the November election. But I would say, I would, I would say, based on the, you know, the, I'm quite, op- I'm, I'm fairly optimistic. Yes, it, it does depend on the uh, on the uh, election. Uh, and uh, in terms of procedure, uh, the the Russian position is that uh, the extension would require approval by the Duma and there there were estimates that it will take uh, about a month or up to two months to to, to do that uh, but uh, I think in terms of uh, practical uh, practicalities uh, if there is a, in two weeks uh, if there is a new administration and in the two weeks be, between the inauguration and the expiration if there is an agreement to extend and then uh, that process will just go uh, along and the Treaty will be preserved and probably extended for the full uh, whole uh, five years. Uh, that said, uh, the the way it uh, would work uh, is, uh, and Russia was clear on that, uh, that uh, the issue, the 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 systems of concern, the the Poseidon, this nuclear powered everything, uh, these. If they were to be included in the treaty, that would have to be a new treaty. 
So there, the new start uh, will cover only what is already in new start, uh, which is the ICBMs, uh, submarines, I mean, submarine launched missiles and uh, bombers. The uh, avant-garde uh, hypersonic glider uh, got into the treaty on technicality uh, because uh, it is de deployed on a missile that is uh, accounted uh, by the treaty. Uh, but it is, in fact, the U.S. position is that if it's a, it, if it were a different missile, not treaty countable, uh, it would not have been counted. So, and if the United States would deploy a similar system, uh, it uh, it would be on a different missile, and it, the the United States, uh, I think, the Congress during the ratification stated clearly that this will not be counted under start. So they, th that dispute will will intensify. And uh, the, the way uh, to include these uh, new exotic systems, as I uh, usually call them, uh, into the treaty, we require a new treaty. Uh, and again, I would imagine that Russia would be reasonably willing to include those in, in, in the new treaty. Uh, however, it would ask for a prize, and that prize, we know that prize, that prize is missile defense. Uh, the, the whole point of this uh, whole zoo of systems is that uh, it, 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 Russia says that it needs them to circumvent uh, U.S. missile defense. So unless there is some movement on missile defense, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, and I think it is impossible to expect that Russia would be willing to put those on the table. And I'm not very optimistic about uh uh, missile defense and the prospects of, uh, of an arrangement regarding missile defense. So we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll be in a difficult situation for some time. Yeah, I agree. I mean, <clears throat> I think Billingsley said at one point that the Russians would have to give some sort of huge offer. And he said, I couldn't even fathom what it could, what it could be, um, for us to discuss ballistic missile defense. Um, one thing I'm always quite interested in, though, I mean, with with the avant-garde, I mean, this started off as a, as a Soviet project in the uh, Project Albatross, I think it was called, in the late 80s or early 90s. And the reason we often hear for some of these for some of these new systems is ballistic missile defense. You know, when the when the US and, and the Soviets um, signed the ABM treaty, I mean, the Americans pretty much got rid of their their um their ABM systems that they had in Grand Forks and Doug, you'll probably know this a bit better. But, you know, they got rid of them pretty quickly because they just saw, you know, the Soviet Marv technology was just made made them redundant. But you still saw some of these missile systems being developed anyway, even though the US didn't, you know, have ballistic missile defense and that there was a there was a treat you know, there was data on a treaty then in place. So I think B BMD is is an issue, and you can you. I mean, there are some really fantastic papers on this from you know from a even from a Chinese perspective. Tong Zhao recently wrote a really great paper. I think it was called "Closing the Gap." Um, but so, sometimes some of the arguments you hear for why these new systems were developed, I, I'm not sure if it's always if it's always BMD. I mean, BMD is concern is concerning, and I think that yeah. Oh no, go on, go on, Pavel. I want to I want to hear what Pavel's got to say on this. No, exactly, and I, I've been uh, I've been studying and I've been looking at the history of missile defense back uh, in the, from the early years and uh, to our time, uh, and it, it's the thing is that uh, these programs are just getting the life of their own, and they they don't really. Uh, care that much whether the original uh, rationale for them uh, still exists. Uh, and uh, with with missile defense, uh, the uh, my take is that uh, again, if you look at the history, the the story of missile defense is that uh, missile defense uh, works great against missiles that don't exist. So, and as soon as you get uh, actual missiles that the defense uh, has to face, uh, then everybody quickly realizes that, well, maybe relying on missile defense is not such a good idea. Uh, but even then, the, the idea of defense doesn't really die uh, entirely, and it just goes in circles. So now we are in the phase where there are no actual missiles uh, that uh, missile defense uh, would would counter in the sense that the, the, the Russian missiles are 
can already penetrate that defense and they know that and everybody knows that uh and uh the uh, north korean or iranian missiles they are just not there and as soon as they are there then people will again take a look and say well you know what maybe missile defense is not such a good idea maybe we should not be spending money on that well maybe to move on the last on to the last question that i have for you all um I'd like to try and finish the episode on a slightly more positive note. <laughs> so my question is, do any of you see positive signs in the future of arms control uh, in the years ahead? Or is it all doom and gloom? Yeah, I, I do, actually. Um, go, going back to the um, the Missile Dialogue Initiative project here at the IISS, we recently had our second meeting of the MDI, and we had around 120 participants um, from 35 different countries. Um, our focus for 2020 has been on the Asia-Pacific, um, and we had uh, representatives from 25 governments there and a really strong focus from the Asia-Pacific. And we were able to have you know, interventions from from senior level from P5 countries, I think, you know, there was there was clearly an appetite to have these discussions, even though the conversations sometimes are quite difficult. Um, you know, I, th I think that you can see that this isn't something that people are willing just to let happen and say, oh, well, you know, that was that's, uh, you know, that was a shame that that didn't work out. You know, I think there is there is, you know, some attempt to try to try to break some of these difficult issues. Uh, you know, how, how long that will take, I don't know how easy it will be you know i don't think anyone's under the impression that it is going to be straightforward but i think that there you can see that there is a uh, there is a vindication for both for the project um and and you know that, that states do want these issues resolved okay i i may not have a, a an entirely optimistic uh, take uh, although i'll try so i think we are uh, now in a position where it is clear that uh, things are going to get worse uh, before they get better. So we will see further deterioration of uh, US-Russian relations, the NATO-Russia uh, relations, and uh, we will probably see uh, de development and deployment uh, of quite a few missiles. However, the, the optimistic part of that is that uh, it appears that we learned some of the lessons of the past uh, downturn. So it, so it will not get as bad as in 83, let me put it that way. So, uh, uh, and, and I hope, and it, uh, as Tim just uh, mentioned, that there is, a, there is an interest uh, in the community uh, of, to discussing these issues, to finding solutions and uh, I think that there there is a better understanding now uh, of the dangers, uh, and uh, there are there is better understanding of ways to uh, avoid these dangers. So, so that's so I I'm I'm cautiously optimistic, although I'm prepared to live through uh, some difficult time. Yeah, um, uh, somewhere between. Uh, cautious optimism and uh, and outrageous pessimism um you know arms control only becomes more important in, in periods of tension and you know when you're you know you see the the, the reemergence of, of of peer rivalry or, or great power rivalry or call, call it what you will um i'm of an age however that i can remember the start of the 1980s which were uh, pretty bleak in terms of superpower relations uh, and if somebody said to me in 1980, did I see uh, much hope for the kind of dual track um, outcome that actually occurred and, and that the 1987 INF Treaty was was agreed? Um, and I said, probably not. So perhaps there's just a slight kind of glimmer of, of hope in that, you know, um, even when things are very bad, uh, if the if the sides involved can keep talking, then you never quite know where you're going to end up. I'm going to cut you off there so you can't revert back on it. And we'll end on that point of uh, hope. Um, sadly, I think that is all the time that we have for today. But thank you, three, uh, Pavel, Doug, and Tim, for joining me. It's been hugely informative. And uh, we look forward to following all the excellent work that you're doing on the MDI project. And thank you all for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Don't forget to follow, rate, and subscribe to Sound Strategic wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And for the latest research and analysis of global defense and security issues, 
Check out the WSS website or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. See you all next time.